Now, who's excited to hear from Pastor Helen? I had the privilege of being in the 9.30 and she is just a woman of faith. Her stories that she shares just make you feel like what you thought was impossible is possible. What you thought was unreachable is actually attainable. And um, so I'd love to invite Pastor Helen. She's a grandmother of grandkids. She's got kids. She's got a little dog called Molly who she'll talk about. But really, Pastor Helen and Bruce, we are living in the overflow of what they have sown their lives into. In their mid-50s, they obeyed God, came to the other side of the world to plant a church, the first Equippers Church, and spent seven years here away from family, away from what you think is the normal today. But I just love her faith, her tenacity. When you hear her pray, it's like things shift. She's a warrior. And I don't encourage you to lean in. I'd encourage you to stand up actually because she is a general of the faith and I think we want to receive her as she is. We get out what we honour. And so would you put your hands together for Pastor Helen this morning. Thank you. Thank you for your lovely welcome, Monica. Um, It's just an honour to be here. I count it a great honour and we just know God's going to encourage you in your faith today. So how about just lifting up your hands? Father, we thank You that You're gonna move today, that You're gonna shift things in our lives. You're gonna drop words. And Father, I just saw in the Spirit that You're gonna break clouds, that there's some people that feel like they've been under a cloud. But Father, we thank You on the authority of the name of Jesus. We shift that cloud off people's minds, off people's lives right now, Lord God, that the sun will shine. Father, that the Word of God will become alive in their heart and they would have the courage to do what you're asking them to do. We say no more clouds in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may take a seat. Right. Good. I'm glad there's faith in the house. That's exciting. So, um, yeah, as as I've been introduced, my name's Helen. My middle name is Joy, and I didn't used to like it, and then I'm like, I love it, because Helen means light, and Joy means joy. And I live with an overflow of joy. Even when I go through things, joy is not that far away. So we had four children ourselves. We have 12 grandchildren, and two of them are getting married this year. How exciting is that? So, woo! So um, Bruce said to put up a picture. This is Bruce's idea. He said, you guys love dogs, okay? So here's our little girl, <laughs> and this is Valentine's Day. She's in a, like a dog hotel called Woof Woof Ranch, and she's getting special attention. She has her own little cubicle to sleep in and a Woof Woof treat on her pillow, but they always do activities with the dog. But um, I needed an extra night because I hadn't actually calculated when we get back and when we pick her up, and she just said, Molly is madly besotted with Snoopy. And so Snoopy's just gone home, and so that's why she's like, that. they put a little caption, I'll wait for you, Snoopy. How cute is that? So um, Bruce and I love that, so that's exciting. She's been looked after, and she's fallen in love while we're away. <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk about faith, and faith, you've been hearing a lot about faith, and I'm just going to testify a lot, as well as um, inspire you with scriptures But Hebrews 11, verse 6, you would all know this off by heart. Who knows without looking at it? I'm sure you know it. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. He is everything he says he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is not a holdout God. God is a generous God. God wants to come through on your behalf. And somebody who's seeking him here today, God would say that he's gonna come through uh, on your behalf. Where maybe it's a financial need. I see that it's been a concern. God says that he's gonna come through for you. He's not a holdout God. He's the God of the much, much more. And so I've just framed this today. The word of God works. What he says works, and we need to get into his word. His word is alive, it's active, and in Hebrews 4 verse 12, it says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's not dull. 
I love my devotions. Do you love your devotions? God's speaking to you every day through the word of God, quickening my spirit, piercing even to the division of soul and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. Isn't that awesome? God's word works. So I thought I'd give testimony. In the year 2000, Bruce and I, and Monica has alluded to it, left New Zealand and came to London. We had a prompting in the spirit and to plant a church here. We saw a church plant here being like a beachhead into Europe. We'd plant a church here, would overflow into Europe. And so here's the scriptures that we've got that we prayed at that time that we have seen come to pass. The word of God comes to pass. Won't tarry, but it will be fulfilled. And these are the specific words to encourage you to believe the word of God. When he speaks, he purposes it to outwork that word as long as we hold on. So Isaiah 60 Verse 22 was a word Bruce and I prayed, a little one, because we were little to start in Isleworth, shall become a thousand and a small one, a great nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. Another one we prayed was Genesis 49, 22. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well, and his branches run over the wall and that's where we saw that the branches of equippers, the fruit of equippers, the life of equippers would run over into Europe. You know, without God, without faith, that's too big. That's an impossible task. But when we trust God to fulfill his word, we are faithful to pray his word and reinforce it with our actions. God works. And we were just in a, um, a leader seminar in Budapest. And we just marvel that those words, the little one, the small, you know, she'll become a thousand. Equippers UK, collectively, is over a thousand people. Isn't that awesome? God has fulfilled that word. When we looked in Europe, and there's more people seeking to attach, it's like other countries, there are 22 churches in Europe, the UK and Europe. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's Equippers churches. Of course, there's other churches. So the word of God works. And faith in his word brings the breakthrough. So if you're holding out, keep going. Keep reinforcing that word. Keep sending it forth in prayer. Keep proclaiming it because God is faithful to his word. So how do we grow in faith? By hearing. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why your devotion life is important. That's why the preaching of the word is important. And I just pray faith will catch today, that something will ignite in your heart, there'd be a spring, it'd be like, that's right. I remember what God has said. And I believe the man on the end, God says he's reminding you of promises that you've held in your heart that maybe have died down a little bit, but God said he's stirring them up that they're gonna come up in your mind, they're gonna come up in your heart and you're gonna run on these promises because you're about to see them happen. God says, I'm getting you ready and you're gonna move into everything that I've promised. Amen. Amen. So we, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, by exercising our faith. Come on, how does our faith muscle grow? You know, I thought I had faith and then God said, no, your faith muscle is much too small. And I had to go on a journey of discovering what it meant to grow my muscle of faith. And at that time, it was learning how to pray prophetically, learning how to find the word and praying that word out, going like, that's the prophetic word. When it caught in my spirit, that's the answer. Then I was able to grow in faith by using that word against the enemy. The disciples came up to Jesus in Luke 17, this won't go on the board, five and six. They said, increase our faith, give us more faith. But the master said, you don't need more faith. There's no more or less in faith. If you have a bare kernel of faith, say the size of a poppy seed, some say mustard seed, you could say to this sycamore tree, 
Go jump in the lake and it would do it. We need to exercise the faith that we have to see the results and the authority God has given us. So I'm going to talk to you today about strengthening your faith. Do you want to flex your muscle? Does your faith muscle need to get stronger? Yes, okay, it does. We can think we're strong, but then under pressure, how strong are we? How, you know, how do we stand up in faith? And I want to, the first point, I've got three W's, is worship. Come on, worship is beholding God. And thank you, team, for a lovely worship um, session this morning where we all engage. But worship's not just a Sunday event. It's a daily event where we behold God, where we stand and we worship him for who he is. When we worship, it gives us a greater view of who he is and it releases more revelation. You cannot worship without beholding him. Otherwise, is it worship? When we're saying you're worthy, God, you're amazing. God, you're true to who you say you are. God, you're above the heavens. God, you have all authority. For me, worship answers everything. When I'm in the presence of God and I worship, anxiety drops. You know, anything I might be worried about all comes into the priority list, changes. My heart relaxes and I worship God. Surrender happens in worship. That's why, and a lot of people go like, I haven't got time to worship. I like what Sam says. He says, you've, there's enough time. you've got enough time to do the will of God. God wouldn't say, this is my will for you, but no, I'm not gonna give you enough time. It's we who keep ourselves so busy, so harried, so scrambling around, frustrated, whereas we need to make time for worship. And maybe that's a challenge for you here today to worship. Get in that quiet place, lift your heart, behold him. And here's where we can look at our, our God and just say how amazing he is. Psalm 113, verse four to nine. The Lord is high. Is he in that position? Come on, this is faith, challenges of faith. High above all nations. His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor out of the dust and he lifts the needy out of the ash heap. Aren't you glad about that? And I love how this verse was headed up. It said, the majesty and condensation, condescension of God, not condensation. <laughs> That's what we get when the room's too hot. <laughs> okay, the majesty and condescension of God. When we think of condescending, if somebody was condescending, we'd be saying they're looking from a prideful attitude, looking down on others like they think they're better. But that is not the heart with, uh, of God. It's not so with God. He looks from, not from a prideful heart, but a pure heart with sincere love. He's God but he condescends. And in some versions it says he stoops to behold those on the earth, to lift those out of the ash heap and to lift the needy and to place them with princes and kings. And that makes me want to worship. God is able to bend without losing any aspect of himself. Don't you just love God? How personal is that? that he's a great God, but he can come down to where we are to lift us up. Jesus stooped. And I'm just gonna tell you a little story about Benjamin Franklin. It just says the American Puritan preacher, Cotton Mather invited a young Benjamin Franklin, writer, scientist, inventor, statesman, diplomat, printer, and publisher, over for dinner one night and showed him his library. As they walked through a narrow passage into the library, Mather yelled back at Franklin, stoop, stoop. Franklin didn't understand the exhortation until it was too late, bumping his head on a low beam. Mather turned the situation into a sermon. Let this be a caution to you, not always to hold your head so high. Stoop, young man, 
Stoop as you go through this world and you'll miss many hard thumps. Who knows that we can have hard thumps just through life? Sometimes through sickness, through situations, from breakdowns and different things, breakdowns of relationship. You know, we can receive hard thumps. But sometimes we invite hard thumps where we hit our head because we're prideful, we're independent, we're rebellious or careless. And I know that doesn't apply to any of you in this room. But let's not be wise in our own eyes. Many years later, Franklin told Mather's son that he never forgot that moment. This advice, thus bit into my head, has frequently been of use to me, said Franklin. And I often think of it when I see pride mortified and misfortunes brought upon people by carrying their heads too high. We know that Jesus is the glory and the lifter of our heads because our heads have been down. But when our heads are up because we're proud, because we think we know better than God, then we're likely to come up against obstacles and hurt ourselves in the process. Pride is the first chapter in the book of failure. When we hold our head too high and against the wisdom and the word of God. Humility is the first chapter in the book of success. Depending on God, loving God, Worshipping God. This is the first chapter of the book of success where you'll see God's word working for you. God's on your side. So how about we stoop to behold? Just lift your head now and your eyes and behold God. Come on, he wants to show you and I more and more of himself. Behold the beauty of Christ in your life and all in the people around you. God is to be worshipped. To stoop is to be thankful. Oh God, I lift my heart. I look and I acknowledge all that you've done. How often do people forget to be thankful? Let's be generous people that thank God for his generosity towards us. His heart is always open. You know, maybe we need to recognize where we maybe, maybe got our head too high. How do we turn around? We've got to acknowledge we're in the wrong place. Maybe pride has been elevated. Maybe we've followed our own reasoning. Maybe we've let doubt or fear come in. Maybe the enemy's lied to us and taken us into a wrong place. And I just want to share the story of Ruth, which you're probably well familiar with, but we'll use this as a basis. So I'm going to read from Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 to 7. If you can read along on the screen, it would be great. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, (laughs) Ithratites of Bethlehem. I can normally say that. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. She was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the woman of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. And in verse six, she arose with her daughter-in-laws that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was and her two daughter-in-laws with her and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. What was the turnaround in Naomi? It was she embraced the truth that she was actually in the wrong place. They were in the wrong place because of unbelief. There was a famine in the land and they sought to save themselves, to spare themselves, and they ran away. Instead of running to God in faith, they ran away from him. And we've got to make sure we're in a hard time. We run to God, not from God, not relying on our own um, ability to try and work it out, but we trust God. Do you know there is provision even in hard times? Sometimes it's miraculous, like manna, in the hard times of our lives. I find God drops things for me, a revelation that hold me, even when I go through a difficult time. The word of God works. 
But this couple had run away. They were in a bad place. She makes a decision to return. She's got a glimmer of hope that maybe things will be different if she returns to her homeland. She's acknowledged she's in the wrong place. She's acknowledged that she's out of covering. She's acknowledging that things have gone bad and she's suffering as a result. And she makes a wise decision. I'm going to turn myself around and I'm coming back to faith. And some of us here might need to turn ourselves around and say, I'm coming back to faith. I actually have been in a place of unbelief or doubt or, or wavering, and I'm coming back to faith today. There are places, certain attitudes or unbelief we cannot afford to stay in any longer. Come on, there's a move of God throughout the world. It's like there's a big turn around and God is on the move and we don't want to be stuck in some land missing out on what God wants to do at this time. Faith says, my God can supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. So she gets up, she's got a glimmer of hope. God's visited the land with bread. Maybe things will change for me. But there's a conflict inside her going like, I'm ashamed. Will I be received? Will I be judged for where I've been? And she was fearful as she went back because she was bitter of heart, sad, disappointed. But she made a decision anyway to go back. And things were not as she anticipated to, you know, with the people. It says in uh, verse 19 of Ruth 1, now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem and it happened when they came to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. They were excited. That doesn't mean they were just pleased to see her. They were excited that she had returned. And they said, maybe she wasn't even recognizable. Is this Naomi? But their arms were open wide. So much different from what she anticipated. We need to return to faith wherever we've been. That's why repentance is a key to faith. Repentance guarantees uh, a welcome. God welcomes us when we repent, when we turn, we come, I'm coming back to faith. Come on, it's not that hard. You're all serious on me? It's not that hard. It's turning and saying, yeah, I'm not in the place of faith. I'm, I'm turning around and I'm coming back to faith. So Acts 3.19 says, repent therefore. Be converted that your sins may be blotted out that, so that times of refreshing, just receive it. I just believe God's refreshing people may come from the presence of God. Yeah, the lady over here, yeah, refreshing's coming in the name of Jesus. It's a time to be refreshed, renewed, revitalized, and energized to go again. God says go again. Come back to faith. Repentance guarantees a welcome. Don't you love it? That's why it's good to live a life of repentance. Repentance is not a, a, you know, an unclean word. It's a good word. God, I need to come back to faith. I need to trust you. There's refreshing when I turn around to and, and repent before you and say, I'm coming back to faith. I love little whispers in my ear that God gives me to turn me around when I'm maybe not as strong in faith. And one of the first ones he said was about my self-protection. I was shy, I was self-conscious, and I had to live in a public arena. Who knows my husband, Bruce, he pulls me into a public arena, whereas I'd rather be private and sort my stuff out privately, but it's like, ah, yank, I'm in a public arena where everyone can see me changing. But I was sort of like self-protective. And God just whispered in my ear, and I love this, he said, Helen, if you protect yourself, I can't because you're in the way. And I had to let go and say, okay, God, I get out of the way. I'm gonna trust you to protect me. God said to me to stop trespassing. Stop going over the line of faith into Holy Spirit territory. And we can be so caring in a way that we, on the line of faith, we pass the point where God says, let go. Trust the Holy Spirit to do the rest. Often we're trying to do the work of the Holy Spirit and he convicted me. And he said, at this point, Helen, I'll show you where you need to let go 
and where you need to just trust the results to me. And in fact, if you don't, you're trespassing on Holy Spirit territory. <gasps> so I don't want to trespass on Holy Spirit territory. I've learned to trust God, to do what he's asked me to, to be faithful, to let go, and then to see God bring about the results. How about in worship, behold God. Just lift him up. God, you're amazing. God, your word works. Thank you for speaking to me. Set aside those times. Let's look at wisdom. Proverbs talks about seeking wisdom. It also talks about the security of wisdom. We're talking about the word of God works. So much wisdom. God's got so much wisdom. His word is full of wisdom. And Proverbs are a book on wisdom. Seek wisdom. And Proverbs 14.33 says, Wisdom rests in the heart of him who has understanding. Do you have a faith that's active? But it's actually a calm faith. Do you have a calm faith? That you've got faith, you're fired up, you're moving, but you're calm. Because you know the results and the wisdom that God brings will just work. So it says, exalt wisdom in Proverbs 4, 7, and 8, and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. And I go around like, if I don't know what to do, oh, Lord, I just embrace your wisdom. In prayer, I picture myself embracing wisdom. And wisdom will promote me. And I get all sorts of downloads like, I couldn't have thought of that. That's the way forward. That brings calm to any question that I have. And we see that in the book of Ruth, Boaz advised Ruth when she was out trying to glean, trying to get a bit of bread for her and Naomi, he says to her, don't glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. More or less what he was saying is, stay in this field of favor. When Naomi returned, not only did she get a welcome, she got an entry into the field of favor where God had gone before to set up things for her that not only would her life turn around, that we see the results, Ruth marries Boaz or Boaz marries Ruth and they have a son and that son is in the lineage of David and in the line of Jesus. How amazing, what a turnaround story. But the advice was stay in your field of favor. God has a field of favor, and often we say, oh, I need to go here, I need to go there, I need to, and, and we, we get a bit frantic. Stay and glean. Get in the slipstream of others of faith who have gone before you because there's enough in their lives that overflows, and grain dropped purposely for Ruth to pick up, and she prospered as a, re a result. Bruce and I watched a, a little bit of a dumb movie just to relax. I'm not really a movie person, a bit of a dumb movie. But wow, I got a profound statement out of it. It was a romantic comedy. Um, it just says, if you sit in the question, the answer will find you. That's so true. I can testify to that, that God will always give you the answer if you don't panic. Don't panic, pray. When you don't panic, the answer will come if you sit in the question. Meditate it, give it to God. Say, show me the way forward. Show me your wisdom, I embrace your wisdom. And faith can be such fun. And I'm gonna share a couple of fun things with you. That from Psalm 5 verse 12, God says, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him. And I took this verse like a favor shield. We've got a favor shield we can dress ourselves in. And we had a need. There was a hundred children. We couldn't fit into the theatre when we went back. The little kids had all got in, but there was a hundred others. And we're like, where are we going to, you know, locate them, accommodate them in their programs? And God gave me a download. Ask the restaurant on the corner if they would delay their opening an hour and let the children come in for five weeks in a row. Do you think that was a crazy ask? But we had a cheeky faith and we're like, come on team, we're gonna put our favor shield around us. That was the word for the moment. Like we're gonna wear our favor shield and we're irresistible. We know they can't say no to us because we've got, you said you will surround the righteous with favor. We're donning our favor shield and we're going. 
We went, we asked, they said, well, think about it. I went back and I said, cheekily, is it a yes or is it a no? They said, it's a yes. And they accommodated, put their business hours back, accommodated 100 children for five Sundays in a row. Isn't that awesome? Come on, get a bit cheeky. Yeah, just go out there. If there's a need, God's more aware of the need than you are and he will accommodate it. And I asked for the invoice twice, no invoice. That was God. That was a word of wisdom, what to do in the season. And it was based on the word of God, our favor shield upon us. Then I'm gonna tell you another one. And this is recent. I'm looking at the time, okay. Bruce and I decided we're gonna move from apartment live um, from house living in the house to an apartment we're looking at the next 10 years ahead of us you know we're not really that old but <laughs> we're looking looking ahead and um, we put an offer on four apartments and we missed them all then we thought well maybe we better sell our house first we did five weeks of open homes and you know that's cleaning your house and getting it looking good every weekend and um, nothing no, yeah, we'd say not a sausage. Oh, is that an English saying? <laughs> I think it is an English saying. Um, nothing. And months later, I was just praying. I wasn't despairing or I wasn't disappointed or anything, but I went, God, what was that about? It seemed like such a waste of time. Did we get it completely wrong? And then God said something amazing to me because God speaks in your language. He said, Helen, When the hydrangeas turn blue, you'll move. Now, I know that sounds strange. And I went like, what? And then I just felt, it was God. Just It just eased and says, when the hydrangeas, I wasn't even watching the hydrangeas or thinking of seasons, but it just ministered. And do you know what? About nine months later, an apartment came on the market. We made an offer on it. This apartment we liked far better than all the other four apartments. And we got it. And we sold our house within the week. (laughs) Woo! And I'm going to show you a picture on the 18th of November. There's our hydrangea bush. And it's green. But then five days later, when we moved, it's blue. God does this all the time. He just backs up the word that he speaks into my, I could tell you lots and lots, and I'm like, God, you're so fun. You're so fun. Let's enjoy God and say, God, I want to believe for downloads that I can hear your wisdom. I can have confidence in what you say. And the last one quickly is to strengthen our faith, get into warfare. You know, don't be passive. Don't sit back and just be a commentator on life and the world and, you know, think we're wise in our own eyes. Get into prayer and send the word of God out. The word of God can bring the answers that this world needs. We're having a lot of protests in New Zealand. A lot of things have gone down, not so good. But do you know there's 10,000 people in Auckland who gathered to pray, open heaven. In other cities, Christchurch, 4,000 people out to pray. The tide is turning. And I believe it's because the church is rising in warfare. I like what Jehoshaphat said. He nearly got killed in a battle he shouldn't have been in. And in 2 Chronicles 20, 20, he says, believe the prophet, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. What's God said to you? What prophetic word do you need to dig up? and go, God, I need to action that. I need to pray that. I need to send that word out. Because Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it will accomplish. It will find that target. It will detonate the enemy. It will destroy the enemy. But it will also create and call into being that which God has established. It shall accomplish What I please, says the Lord, and it shall prosper. God's word prospers. God's word causes things to come to life. 
God's word causes things to spring up that were flat and dead and lifeless. God has prophesied to Ezekiel, prophesy into the dry bone, prophesy. I love running an intercession group and we pick up needs. We're like the four friends on the stretcher. That's who we are. And we carry that, those people who have got needs before Jesus. And we pray and we pray and we knock and we knock until we get the answer. Because life's become hard for these people where they don't have faith for themselves. But we like, we can be your friends and we'll pick up the stretcher. We'll bring you before Jesus. Do you think that stirs our faith? Yeah, as we give out in faith, faith comes because we hear God's word in the midst. How about we start a movement of prayer? Do we have to wait for official ones? We can go to the official, official ones, but we can be prayers. And I liken it to starting a movement in a swimming pool. You start in a direction of faith, of the Word of God, and you watch how other people and the current get stronger and stronger and stronger. I'm gonna prophesy that a lot of you need to lead. Come on, lead yourself in prayer. Lead others in prayer. Expect to see answers in prayer. That's faith. That's strengthening your faith. And the more you give out, the more faith that you receive. How about we strengthen ourselves? in faith and the word of God the crux of my message it works I'm so convinced in the word of God that's why I love it that's why it's you know for the big picture but it's also for the individual how well do you know the word of God do you just sit, leave it till Sundays or are you searching are you picking up the stretcher are you reaching out in faith are we walking with our head too high thinking, I know it all? Let's behold God. Let's worship. And I believe just for a whole new spirit of worship in this place. So, yeah, if the team want to come behind, how about you stand with me? What an awesome church you are. God's smiling on you, son. His smile is towards you. Don't ever, in a sense, miss that smile of favour upon your life. That you're in a new season of favour. The old is gone. It's like God's cut you off from something from the past and you're entering into a brand new season. God says, just open your eyes and I'll show you the way. Don't need to worry. He's got it all figured out. Amen. How about we close our eyes? How about just moving into a, a new place of worship? Oh God, I need to give you more time. It's not a legal thing, not a it's just a relational flow. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, just stretch yourself a little bit further. Come on, we're too small. Come on, expect God to show you who he is. Let's look a bit higher. Thank you, God, you're so able. God, I just pray right now, Lord God, for a, a spirit of worship. Father, it's already here, but I just believe there's new waves of worship. And I believe this church is going to be marked by worship. The music is amazing here, and I just believe for a new wave. Lord, just to roll over people that in worship, people will get a bigger picture of who you are. Thank you that you'll stretch us in worship, that you'll dare us to believe in worship because we see who you are and we take our eyes off ourselves. So right now, Lord, I thank you for that turnaround. I thank you for that repentance. I thank you for that ability to change our minds. Father, and to worship. Right now, just receive. Come on, receive. Desire. Come on, desire is king. Move into that place of worship. Wisdom. Just God talking to you. Just embrace His wisdom. Bring it close. And wisdom will hold you. Lord, I just pray for downloads right now. I just believe to some people, God's just saying, you're okay. I like you. I love you. I don't just love you. I like you. And you haven't been liking yourself. But God says, He likes you. Loves you, but he 
also likes you and he's committed and he wants to enjoy you. Thank you, Lord. The Spirit of God is here because he's anointed us to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captive free. It's for all you and I to be commissioned to war. We war through love. We war through prayer. We war through the Word of God. Right now, just receive a strengthening. Come on, receive a fresh breath of the Holy Spirit. How about if you speak in tongues, speak in tongues. Come on, just let it worship go. Come, thank you, Lord God. We're called. Lord God, the Spirit of God is upon us. Lord God, because you've anointed us. Right now, we pray for a fresh anointing. A fresh anointing, a fresh vision of what you're doing at this time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Just let the Holy Spirit settle. Just the last thing I'll just ask before you go. What will be your story of faith? Will you be able to look back and go, wow, God, wow, God, you moved here, you moved there. And I believe the man in the second row, God's calling you to a greater level of faith. That you've been anointed for such a time as this. This is a time to rise and shine. This is a time to be everything God's called you to be and to put aside the doubts, put aside the fears and God says, you're the one I've chosen. It's you. Only you can do what God has called you to do and this is a time of courage and conviction, saith the Lord. Amen. What is your story of faith? We've all got them, but let's believe for more. God hasn't finished yet. God's got more He wants to do. Bless you.